Good morning. It is my great pleasure to be here to join the celebration of um, 50 years of uh, our, our no uh, bone effect. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'd like to uh, present our work on parent symmetry in high temperature superconductors. In cooperates and in the recently discovered iron nick types. As you know, the, there's a recently, there's a new important member add to the, the growing high temperature superconductor family. Now here is the Very hard to. Um, here's the, 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 the formula. And as an example, lanthanum iron arsenic, oxygen, fluorine. It's doping with uh, fluorine. Fluorine here with TC uh, 26 degree K. Uh, that was discovered uh, a little bit over a year ago. And that caused a lot of interest. And uh, scientists at uh, Chinese Academy of Science, Beijing, China, they uh, replaced this uh, rare earth by other uh, rare earth, uh, lessening by other rare earth elements, such as samarian and the neodymium. They managed to get the TC up to a 55 degree, okay. So this kind of remarkable discovery of iron, uh, high temperature superconductivity in uh, iron-based uh, superconductors really challenged existing paradigm of high temperature superconductivity. That is because they are characterized by complex Fermi surface topology and a small electron correlation unlike the cuprate superconductors. So one of the most important steps to understand superconductivity in iron pinectite is to elucidate the nature of pairing, in particular pairing sym symmetry. So this requires to us to do a phase-sensitive <laughs> symmetry experiment. And um, we do have uh, some very new results on the symmetry of the, all this uh, iron, uh, iron arsenic based superconductors. Now, before I present that, let me uh, just take a few minutes to talk about a uh, phase sensitive experiment that we did in the Cooperage, just to set the stage for later presentation of the new results. Well, phase sensitive experiment. It's based on two macroscopic uh, quantum ph phenomena, namely Josephson pair tunneling and the flux quantization. Here's Josephson expression for supercurrent. And uh, if you make a junction out of um, uh, unconventional superconductor, namely non S wave superconductor, then it is possible to have a junction that will give you a negative supercurrent. What that means is if you absorb this negative sign in the sine function that will give you a pi phase shift. <coughs> now here is nothing more than the requirement of a macroscopic pair wave function uh, to be a single value as you go around a loop of two pi. So when you calculate the energy then you will find you have a, you work with a, a superconductive loop containing Joseph junctions. All you have to do is just count the number of side chains in supercurrent. If it's an even number of side chains, then you get net phase of 0 or 2 pi. And that leads to regular integer flux quantization, as I indicated here. Now, if the side chain is an odd number, then you get a net phase change of pi. 
that would lead the system would be frustrated. And once to uh, relax, compensate the energy, the Joseph Junction, as you put a pipe in here, and that would uh, cause the system to spontaneously generate a current. Uh, that produce a half flux quantum. In here, you have a plus, minus, half flux quantum threading in the, in the loop. And this is a doubly degenerate, time reversed uh, ground state of the pi, the pi loop, loop. And that corresponds to the supercurrent flowing in the ring clockwise, counterclockwise. The, the energy is the same. Now, as a function of the loop geometry, then one can uh, uh, one can use the presence and the absence of a half loss quantum effect uh, for probing the phase of the order parameter, in this case, energy gap as a function of K. Uh, in the past, there are several techniques uh, for developed for observing the half loss quantum effect. Let me concentrate. Uh, uh, our own experiment, we call the tricrystal experiment. Uh, I designed this experiment with a substrate uh, consisting of uh, three crystals, specifically or oriented, is such that uh, if it's a D wave, if it's a D wave, and if you pattern a high TC film, a ring on, on it. Now, at the tricrystal point, it has a three junctions and a chain sign once. Therefore, if it's a D wave, like I showed here, uh, it should show half flux quantum at the center ring, but not the other ring. The other ring just the control of my experiment. And indeed, we were very, very uh, uh, happy, I remember, when we first found this using a scanning uh, uh, script microscope. Here shows the image of a scanning script microscope. And uh, uh, here's the, the, in the center, you see the, the forget about it. <laughs> you, you see the, sen the center, the, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, some signal. We calibrate it. Indeed, that's a half loss quantum. And then, uh, after that as established, then you don't need it to do the patterning. The patterning is kind of hard, especially make a ring right at the center of the, the tricrystal uh, meeting point. Now, what do you do is uh, you just deposit the film. And using a scanning squid microscope, look at the, the, the vortex. And you see at the center, there's a, a small vortex in there. That's a half loss one. At the track with, uh, that's where you're supposed to be, if it's a D wave. And then you see the, the Josephson vortex along the boundaries. You see, outline the, the bound like this and that. And there are apricosal vortex in the gray. They're all single flux quantum, except the one, the, the, the meeting point is a half. So this represents strong evidence for D wave in corporate superconductor. Now, I want to mention that uh, when I designed this experiment, I took into account uh, the junction interface, the grand boundary junction interface may not be ideal. So I used the formula of a Seagrid's rise clean limit as well as the formula I developed for maximum disorder. So in other words, this design is a foolproof. That regardless how bad is the, the junction interface, as long as you have a supercurrent flowing, you will get half plus one if it's a D-wave. So, uh, so this is really, it's a yes or no parasymmetry test. Very definitive test. And for those who are interested in more details, we, we have a, a, a review article. You want to take a look? Okay, now let's get to the uh, presentation of uh, our new results the phase sensitive experiment for definitive determination of order parameter symmetry in iron panic type. Um, this is based on uh, uh, unpublished work uh, entitled 
integer and half integer flux quantization transition in a nile beam polycrystalline iron nuclear loop. And here's my co workers. And especially, I want to mention uh, Qing Zhu Chen. Uh, she's uh, my postdoc. And she did uh, a lot of uh, work on, on this, made an important contribution to all aspects of the work. And the sample, the high quality polycrystalline sample, uh, was provided by Ren and Zhao from Chinese Academy of Science, Beijing, China. Okay, what is the difference between the cuprate and iron pinnictite? Now, basically, it's the band structure. In the iron pinnictite, the band structure derived from the iron D, uh, D orbitals, as I indi indicated here. And uh, sure enough, the photo emission result indicates indeed you have uh, multiple Fermi surface sheets. In the center, you have a. Uh, in the center, you have a. Uh, uh, this uh, whole uh, pocket, and then uh, outside you have uh, the electron pocket. So totally five uh, Fermi surface sheet, and this is in contrast to this uh, single band uh, physics involved in the cuprate. That you have only one single band. So that's a. Uh, quite different between those two systems. And uh, as a result of this, it's very interesting. So uh, the Fermi surface is very complicated. Of course, that leads to complication in determining the parent symmetry. Now, the theoretical predictions about the parent symmetry based on spin fluctuation models, people say that uh, it could be S plus minus. In other words, if you have a pair coupling uh, process going like this from one Fermi surface sheet to the another. And that will give you the so-called S plus minus. In other words, each Fermi surface sheet is S width. But in between those two Fermi a change sign. So that's why if one's a plus, the other one's minus. So that's why it's called S plus minus. And it could be D width. And it even could be uh, pure S width, the regular S width. And there are other theories that says it could be, it could be P wave. So we got to do experiment to detect the sign change if it's a S plus minus. Okay. Now the, the current status right now is that there's lots lots of experiment. They are trying to figure out what is the parent symmetry in those new materials. However. Most experiments are amplitude sensitive. In other words, it's making measurement of the pair wave function the amplitude, not phase. So that's why it's model dependent. It's difficult to pin down uh, unambiguously what is the pair symmetry. So you've got to use a phase sensitive experiment. So that's what I'm, I'm here trying to present. And here, I want to mention the challenge in design of such a phase sensitive experiment. The reason why is this. First of all, we don't have the, the, the high quality material. We don't have a, a, a large high quality uh, crystal, single crystal. Uh, we don't have uh, epitaxial films, a good, a high quality epitaxial film. That makes it very, very difficult to do an experiment. And furthermore, the Fermi surface structure is so complicated that makes it even worse. And let me, let's recall the, the early days when we did the D wave experiment. For instance, here, if you have a D wave material like this, and you make a corner junction uh, using S wave, like a Niobe, which is a sing singular, even parity, regular <coughs> S wave superconductor, then you see you, you have a, you, 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 you see you go from, uh, from this direction, the current goes this direction, so plus to plus. But you go the other direction, it's minus to plus. So as you circle around the current, supercurrent circle around this corner, what do you get? You get a sign change once. So you expect there will be a half flux one here. And that's indeed the case. So it's relatively easy because there is a one to one uh, from a K dependence, a K, uh, K representation to R representation. So you can design an experiment like this relatively, with relative ease. Uh, here it just shows uh, one example. 
which we published a paper in Nature uh, year 2003. You see, again here, uh, it, there's a co the corner, corner jun junctions. The corner junction will give you the half plus quantum effect, and that you, you show, show as a, the, the zigzag pattern of a half plus quantum. One is up, down, up, down, because they anti ferromagnetic coupled. So that's what, what you get. Now, in this case here, it's very, very difficult. If it's S plus minus, there is no apparent symmetry breaking that you can use in designing the experiment. So that's a very, very difficult uh, experiment to do. So our approach is this. We, um, we try to establish a microscopic uh, quantum coherence across the interface, the singular pairing, niobium and uh, neodymium, this is the iron pinic type. We want to observe, first observe supercurrent. Now we want to see flux quantization. Remember, flux quantization is the final h over 2e. That's a very, very small number. You've got to do a very good experiment in order to see it. You've got to do experiment in a low noise environment with a very sensitive instrument to see that. So here's our experiment set up. So what we, we, we have is a, a niobium loop here interrupted by polycrystalline material, neodymium 1111, that's the, the iron arsenic pinectite. And uh, here, uh, uh, there's a two point, uh, point contact junction here. And uh, notice we have a, a couple of beryllium uh, springs loaded with, you know, against it. So we can adjust the contact strength by uh, adjust the, the, the spring uh, strength. Okay, here's a, a toroidal co coil that we use to apply magnetic field uh, in, into, the, into the, the, the niobium ring. And yesterday in, this, in the talk, several people uh, mentioned the to toroidal coil. Now you got it. <laughs> okay, now this is the pickup coil for the squid, using squid to monitoring the magnetic flux state in the, in the ring. Now here is uh, what we call the uh, electromagnetic uh, uh, excitation d d device to input some ex electromagnetic disturbance, pulses, in order to, uh, to induce the flux change in, in the niobium. Uh, here's the results. See, as you, um, as you uh, um, increased the field, see, see here's the Here's the, 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 uh, the loop with the magnetic field in, in, in it. And as you apply the flux, the, the system uh, develops a, a, a diamagnetic response. So you get a supercurrent uh, going up and up with the magnetic field until it reaches a sort of critical value, critical current. And then what happens is that uh, is, uh, it will let flux come in or out. And uh, here's the, 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 that's why you, you see the zigzag that indicates that the flux start coming in and out the, the, the ring. Now, if you adjust the, the, the coupling strength uh, appropriately, low, low uh, uh, con contact, and then what happens is you, you see you can even resolve single flux quantum. The red bar represents a single flux quantum. Okay, the, the blue one means a bundle of flux coming in. So that's the applied magnetic field. Now let's do another experiment. Let's not apply magnetic field, just start with and you prepare the system with some flux in it. Then you turn on this, uh, this electromagnetic uh, device here. This is not a sophisticated device. It basically, it's a hair dryer that I put it in the field. <laughs> The, the, the other side of the lab, and I turn the switch up and down, the noise will get into my, the, the, the magnetic shear room, and the system is so sensitive would detect that. And uh, that caused the magnetic flux change. Okay, so what, what do you get? You get a flux, single flux jump, and uh, multiple flux jump. But uh, they're all integer, finite, in terms of the multiple units of finite. <coughs> So just with this, we can say something about the parity of the, the new material. Because we observe a macroscopic quantum coherence through the, through the, the, the diamond supercurrent, 
and also through the flux condensation. And now we use spin singlet, even parity material. So it has to be uh, singlet. So that right there, we rule out P wave. OK, now the next step is to do the same experiment. But I think about it, since we use a, a polycrystalline material, the polycrystalline material, you can have a different uh, flow pattern of the supercurrent. And that supercurrent current correspond to, you know, in terms of the energy landscape, that means uh, a different energies. So when you zap with the electromagnetic pulse, it will maybe the, 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 the current flow, the main current flow, will jump from one to another. One may be contains no pi junction, the other one may have pi junction in, you know, along the, the, the way. So that will give you what? Give you a half integer flux. Remember, if you stay on one pass, then you, you cause this magnetic flux jump. That will only give you integer flux. You've got to switch the pass in order to see the half flux. Okay. And indeed, uh, after we uh, um, manipulate the, the experimental parameter, we see half now. Now, the dot line means the middle of an uh, uh, integer of flux quantum. So you see the, 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 the jump, now you see half, two half, three half, and so on. In addition, you have integer. OK, here's a summary of a, of a result as a function of coupling strengths. And uh, I mean, since we observe uh, hundreds, hundreds of uh, such a quantum flux quantum transition, so let's plot histogram to see. Now, when the current is like this, you, you have only the integer flux jump. Now, when you reduce, uh, increase the current, you push the, the point contact a little bit harder, then you start to see the, the half flux quantum. Push more, you get more. But the, clearly, you see there's two uh, distribution profiles. In other words, they're different. They're not just one, one story. There are two, two things. And that's, that's consistent with the, the thing I just uh, discussed. You need to see, uh, to see um, half-less uh, quantization, you need to switch paths. So that just shows the red and the blue here represent two different paths. So it's a highly su uh, suggestive, but I don't have a hard proof of it. OK. And now then people will just start worrying especially my postdoc, we we'll, we'll worry about, oh, could it be this, this is an artifact? Could be something else? So we try to rule out all the other possibilities. Uh, I don't have time to do them. Oh, yeah, one thing I want to mention, uh, the, the, this experiment setup is very nice. You could just pull out uh, the polycrystalline material, put niobium back in, and that, you, you know, nothing, nothing weird will happen. You, see, you should see a single flux. We never saw any half flux. So that, that's a very, very reassuring. The, the thing we saw that was really uh, genuine. So the half flux quantum jump really is not artifact. OK, now with this, we can, we're in a position to say something. Let's say since we, uh, we, we uh, non zero finite Joseph the current, we say it's a spin singlet. Half flux quantum told us. There's a sign change now in, in a current, in a supercurrent, flow through the sample. And uh, then we rely on other you know, uh, people's uh, work published in the literature. I do not have a, I have cited it here. And they clearly show it's not D wave. So if you use that to rule out D wave, then our experiment <laughs> represents first definitive experimental evidence to show the new superconductor is S plus minus. Oh, uh, then you, you, if you are interested in it, you can uh, find out uh, what, what are the, the possible source of a uh, pi junction in, in this experimental setup. We say there are two possibilities. One is uh, at the now beam new, uh, iron penicti interface. In other words, this is the point contact right at the contact. The other thing is uh, in between the contact, the polycrystalline material, in, in, in you, you, should, you could have a sign change over there. So those are the two possibilities. 
And uh, in the literature already, there are some, some uh, papers discuss about uh, the, such uh, possibilities. OK, conclusion. So we observe uh, macroscopic <coughs> quantum coherence across niobium neodymium 111 junction interface. We uh, observe diamagnetic supercurrent. Uh, we observe quantized flux jump. And in particular, we observe new half quantum effect. And all this leads to the conclusion the new material is a singular pairing, even parity, and S plus minus pairing symmetry. OK, let me, uh, how, how much time do I have? Five? What? Oh, let me just quickly finish it, OK? Um, um, we, we know there is a sign change. So in other words, the gap, gap function has a sign, sign change. If you put this into a BCS gap equation, now with knowing that this has a sign change, now how to solve this V, V is the, the pairing potential. Okay? Then you, can, you have to conclude the potential has to be something like this. In other words, uh, uh, here's uh, a relative small q, V, uh, v as, a, as, a, as a function of a momentum transfer, the small q. This has to be um, attractive, relatively attractive. You can be, the whole thing can be repulsive, but this has to be relatively less repulsive. And here's a repulsive in this case. Now, in, in, the, in the iron connectile, let's say we assume the uh, uh, simplest case, you have a two band, two band, another two Fermi surface, okay? Then you, you, you get the same conclusion. Uh, the signs should be, should be reversed. So that's consistent with S plus minus. So the constraint on high temperature supercondition pairing mechanism, this is what we really we want to to get a handle on it. The basic message is to say that the pair interaction has to be large Q, be repulsive, small Q, attractive. This is applied for both D wave and S plus minus symmetry. Turns out they, they give you the same requirement. Now, what are the possible high temperature uh, superconductivity mechanism? I would say, um, uh, this is, has to be unconventional, even the electron phonon has to be unconventional. Why? Because uh, there is some theoretical calculation indicates that uh, the electron phonon coupling, a regular electron phonon, just simply does not support high TC in, in this system. So if anything, it has to be a specialized phonon, unharmonic, nonlinear coupling, and so on. I did some work along these lines uh, recently. The other thing, obviously, is the spin of fluctuation immediately by the period. That will automatically give lead to S plus minus. Then the other thing is that it's possible a combination of one and two, one and two. Now, in the case of a cuprate, maybe, maybe one, one is more dominant. In the, in the case of iron penectite, maybe two is more dominant because the presence of iron uh, magnetic lattice in, in, in the system. So with that, let me uh, conclude my talk. Uh, let me uh, thank my co-workers, um, especially John Curley. He worked closely with me, and uh, he did uh, all the scanning squid microscope measurements, and uh, other colleagues. And more recently, this is uh, my uh, co-workers uh, on the new, new experiments. Okay, so let me stop here. Let me thank you for your attention. <laughs> you want to ask a question about my, my, my picture here? Yeah. <laughs> okay, see here it shows, shows that I'm standing uh, on, a, on a strong mat. Oh, and, uh, and that's floating above uh, YBCO, the high temperature superconductor. And this, so that's why I said uh, uh, I was levitated by a strong magnet above a supercomputing YBCO disk. Now here's the disk. That's the magnet. I was standing there, 
and uh, you can test. You can uh, run a rope behind it, and uh, nothing, just like magic. And uh, people can uh, rotate, you know, spin around. And so I was really floating in the air. Now, uh, you see, you see here, in in the background, in the background is the liquid, uh, liquid nitrogen tank. So it is my sincere wish. You know, we work hard enough. If we get the high temperature superconducting mechanism, that will lead to the discovery of uh, even more higher TC material. Hopefully, we can get low temperature superconducting. Now you don't need the liquid nitrogen here. Maybe all you need is just uh, just cold water. And uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, you, you didn't say anything about. Thank you. You, did, you didn't say anything about the magnetic state above the superconducting uh, the transition. Uh, yeah, are these uh, are these antiferromagnets? Uh, yeah, broadly speaking, it, it is antiferromagnet. But uh, this material is an implant uh, magnetic structure called linear spherical like, like this. Right. So the the antiferromagnetism persists below the transition temperature. Is, uh, and you know that it's, dependent, it's doping, dependent. doping dependent. Doping dependent. And you know that by the samples are big enough that you have neutron diffraction data on them. Yeah, there's some some uh, I didn't do, they're in the literature. Lots lots of data. Okay. Neutron scattering and other measurements. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Jeff Hall. Okay. So let's thank Dr. Sui again for his talk.